Hello, friends. As you can hear, I am uh, my hair's down. Thought I'd give that a go today. Um, my, I am not coughing. My guts up. So we're going to count that as a win. And uh, it's a little bit strange. We are here on a Friday evening. My son is not quite yet asleep, and thus <laughs> we may get some noisy interruptions. But we will power through as best we can. I may start coughing. Uh, in the middle of this because I am feeling much better but occasionally I am beset by a coughing fit. Uh, we will soldier on. For those of you who I've seen in the chat couldn't be here for the live because you are over at the Tudor conference which my lovely friend Philippa is running and which my talk is going to be uh, aired tomorrow and then on Sunday I will be part of the Q&A with that is if Wi-Fi cooperates because I'm not actually going to be at home on Sunday, I uh, and this is another reason for doing this live stream today because I'm actually off on my holidays, so I'm not going to be about. But uh, uh, so I hope to see some of you on Sunday as well. And uh, that the I think this conference is going to be fabulous. There are some amazing speakers, and I feel privileged to be a part of them. But we are here to talk about the history news. To be clear, what we are doing today is the history news that I had prepared for Monday. I had my slideshow all ready to go and I just sort of came to the conclusion that I really wasn't well enough to get through 40 odd slides because I could barely speak. So this is that same live. It has literally been postponed. postponed. I have, of course, seen all of the news items that have been sent to me since Monday, so they are not included in this. We will be having a History News Live again on a random day next Sunday, so not in two days' time, in a week and two days' time. And the reason for it being a Sunday rather than a Monday is because Monday the 27th is my husband's birthday, and I feel that I should probably do the decent thing and spend time with him while I, uh, well, on his birthday, um, rather than coming to speak to you lovely people, and we can do it on the Sunday. So that is the plan. Welcome everybody who has joined us live. And also if you haven't joined us live, welcome if you are watching on the playback. We do have some updates, some repatriation slash decolonization news. We have got some new news. We've got a ding dong. We've got some events and exhibitions. I have prepared the Opera Pin Board. It is linked in the description box. All of the articles we are talking about today are on the Opera Pin Board. You will also notice in the description box that the articles are numbered. Those numbers do relate to the numbers on the bottoms of the slides that are going to be on screen shortly. So if you want to know more about a particular story, it's very helpfully numbered. That was a suggestion from a wonderful viewer who told me how I could make this a lot clearer for everybody. So I'm I, I always am very keen for people who, when they've got a great idea about how I can make the content more streamlined and smoother, and that is an absolutely genius idea. So I'm very pleased that we've been putting that in place. So if you check the bottom of the slide, the number there, it will correspond with what's in the description box. And uh, what else have I got to say? I've Lots of people have sent me articles. And I am very, very grateful, as always, when I see those articles come in. It just reminds me that out and about in your day-to-day -day life, something comes across your inbox and it makes you think of me and then you take the time to send it. I am very, very grateful, as I am very, very grateful for everybody who watches, who interacts, all of, all of the really cool stuff that is happening in my life at the moment and the stuff that I get to do because of this channel is because of you guys because you turn up, you watch, you comment, you help me to grow the channel. And the, the knock-on effect of that is that I get to do really, really cool stuff and meet really cool people and have really cool opportunities. And I'm just incredibly grateful for all of it. I uh, am seeing mention to the Ravelry group. If you are into Ravelry, there is a group for you that's been set up by somebody a few people in this current chat it's reading the past fiber artists uh, I am not on Ravelry I don't really know what it is I know it's about crochet and maybe also knitting other things um, but yes if you would like to check that out um, there are ways that you can log on to that I am sure. Without further ado let us hop into the thanks and then we will hop in to the chat. Before we do that, actually, let's just say some hellos. Oh, that's my usual thing to do, isn't it? 
Gert's garden. Well, I'm very pleased you've got today off too. What a wonderful, it's always good to have a Friday off, I think. And I'm sorry it's cold and rainy. It's pretty cold and miserable over here as well, to be honest. Where, meanwhile, Lizzie is over in the Caribbean. So you, you've got the lovely weather. Congratulations to you. Hello, Michael. Quite right. Shoo the hubby away. Get him, Get some tea made. Lovely. Um, hello to everybody who's joined in the chat. I am going to jump in and get stuff underway because we do have quite a few slides and I just want to make sure that my voice does hold out. So thank you to everybody. Thank you for sending me news articles. Steve, Beth, Alberta, Jesse, Verity, Jesse again, I think I've put you in there twice, apologies. Uh, name Twin Cat, Paige, Zoe, Joseph, Pandora Snudpuckle, Alicia, Alicia, sorry, I always say that wrong. Uh, Carve Felum, Yvonne, Jackie, Shane, Kathy, Carol, and Cheryl. Thank you ever so much. I am very, very grateful. Let's hop in to the updates. Now, we touched upon this briefly in the last news item, but we didn't have, I think, the full dealings as to what's going on. This this legal role, legal row that's kicked off over a markup on the sale of a African mask. What we have here is a second-hand dealer in France who has who has appeared in court, accused of deceiving a couple. He paid 150 euros, which is roughly 130 pounds, for an African mask, which he then resold for 4.2 million euros. As we can see, that's a fair old markup, as that percentage um, does seem to depict. The couple had the mask from Gabon. They are a, pe they're a pair of pensioners, and they sold it to the dealer in 2021, only for the true value to come out six months later. So it's not like <clears throat> there is an element to which clearly this dealer knew what was up and knew what was going on. Um, when the case opened, the government of Gabon asked for the proceedings to be halted, and for the mask to be returned. So now we have, obviously, a, a three-way dispute. This couple are in their 80s. They lived in central France, and they they found this wooden mask in a cupboard. The dealer says that he, he had no idea how valuable it was when he bought it. He clearly, though, had a very swift idea of how valuable it was within the next few months, which, of course, is possible. Of course, it is possible. I, I, would, I would say, though, what... I suppose the question is, what is what is his responsibility? Well, I'm sure the court will find that out. And in March 2022, reading about auction in Montpellier, the couple discovered that it was, in fact, a rare 19th century Nigui mask made by the Fang people of Gabon. And this is where it sounds a bit sketchy, because the catalogue said it had been collected around 1917 by Fournier, quote, in unknown circumstances. Well, the circumstances, they aren't unknown, are they? So that seems like the per person who was selling it to the, through the auction house had a fair idea and wanted to keep the provenance secret. The mask had originally been valued at €300,000, but was sold for €4.2 million. Euros. It went to an unnamed bidder. The couple then launched a civil case to annul the sale. However, the Gabonese government has said that the mask was in fact stolen anyway and should be returned home. This is obviously in the aftermath of what happened in 2020 when the French parliament voted to return to Senegal and Benin artefacts that had been looted in the colonial period. So they do, the French government does already have previous for sending things back. I We'll check and see if there have been further updates. If they have, if we know what the ruling is, I will, of course, let you know. We also have another update on the Just Stop Oil protests. Just Stop Oil activists attack Velasquez's Venus painting in London's National Gallery with hammers, which marks is a marked departure from their usual action, which is throwing paint onto things. Um, these, this is two activists. They were arrested in the aftermath. They went into London's National Gallery, and it seems that they appear they were attacking the painting with what looked to be emergency rescue hammers. So they broke 
having seen the footage, it looks like they broke the glass over the painting. And this is the same painting that was attacked in uh, 1914 when Mary Richardson walked into the gallery and attacked the work with a meat cleaver slashing through the canvas. And it apparently left seven deep gashes in Venus's body. However, the work was later restored. I, I believe that this is an oil painting. Um, I don't think that that's why they attacked it, but that is, if they went after all oil paintings, I, as there is a lot of questions as to why Just Stop Oil are targeting the National Gallery, the National Portrait Gallery, um, et cetera. And I think there are, a, this painting already has previous for being connected to protest movements in a sort of deeds, not words manner. I think that there has obviously been a lot of rhetoric and discourse about asking politely and waiting nicely, which is exactly the same sort of thing that the suffragists were promoting, while the more militant suffragettes were the deeds, not words ladies, who were, for example, sending devices through the mail that might go boom, boom. I'm not sure what I could say on YouTube, but they were setting things. Um, in a flame and they were also sending things via the mail that would be very dangerous so all of that sort of th that sort of behavior the question then becomes how much did that have a role in women winning the vote should we if we associate the suffragettes as heroes heroines of female emancipation the individuals involved in that were committing very aggressive acts that's an excellent way of putting it that i probably won't get uh, banned for incendiary behavior and i don't know what the answer is i don't i don't seek to know i don't seek to claim that i know what the answer to this question is what I do know is that there are things happening in the world, to the world, and it, it, I can certainly see that it feels like people with the power to make changes aren't doing those changes, and it feels quite frustrating and quite frightening. So I, 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 I did think about whether this should be in the ding-dong section, because, of course, it is... A, it is the destruction or an attack or an attempted i don't believe that there was actually a destruction i believe that the glass was broken in the same way when they, when they throw paint on things it is behind a protective glass i haven't put in the in the ding dong section because i am conflicted because of the cause they are working towards and i don't know where i stand on this action in relation to the cause so I don't know. I and I the thing is is it effective? I suppose effective as to what? Is this act going to change government or international policy? No. But what it does do is it puts the cause on the front page. It means that with everything else going on in the world we're still talking about just stop oil. And with a movement like it, that kind of publicity is invaluable. Um, and it, it 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 might be it might well be counterproductive. It absolutely might well be counterproductive. But protest is not supposed to be convenient. And I we are seeing the effects of the rapid heating and, and, and unusual heating of the world. We are seeing unusual climate events. And while I am clearly somebody who wants to protect heritage settings, if they're under six foot of water, this painting isn't going to be safe. This painting isn't going to be safe. So 
I don't I don't know what the what the answer is. There are there have been a lot of museums that have of course taken money from oil companies. There have been numerous museums in the past that have been funded, exhibitions have been funded publicly by things like British Petroleum and other uh, other oil manufacturers are available. So I, I, in some ways I can see a connection, although not many, to my knowledge, are funded in that way now. I'm not familiar with this. I need to look into what that is. But, but I mean, there are, of course, and I think the the perhaps one of the reasons why suffrage was successful is because there were the two schools of thought. There were well, there was the in quotes acceptable polite face of of the suffragists who you know um, asked nicely and and sat back and, and and were very polite about it, and then there was that more militant branch of of the of the suffragettes i don't i don't know i don't think there's been a lot of to my knowledge there's not been a lot of study sociologically or politically about which protest movements the tactics of protest movements that are effective and the ones that categorically are not because so frequently in in the protest movements they they both come into into play Oh, hang on, let me just, um... oh, well, I hope you all have a lovely shower. <laughs> so, I mean, I, <coughs> pardon me, I'm I'm very open to discussion and debate on this. Uh, I, I honestly don't know where I land, um, but I, I think it's, it's, I will keep covering it and we will see what shakes out. The last but by not least update is this one. Hadrian's Wall has been damaged, we learned, by the deliberate felling of the sycamore gap tree. So there has been damage done to the wall. The tree was chainsawed down and it, the wall has suffered cracks and some fragments have come off. We also seem to have a potential motive for what ha might have led to this tree coming down. The Hist historic England have said as well that they carried out an archaeological appraisal of the damage to the wall and they have found cracks and fragments broken off from two of the facing stones. They are also carrying out an analysis of the felled tree and it's been taken away for safekeeping while a decision is made of what to do with it. We are also told in this article that Northumbrians, so the area where this wall slash tree were, who, who were at the scene in September, told the Telegraph newspaper that they thought that the felling was the act of a local, most likely a professional, and someone with a grudge against the National Trust, which owns the land. Now, they haven't been explicit about what that grudge might be, whether it's about uh, land control land maintenance what you're allowed to do on certain bits of land whether this person disagrees with it and or if it's about some of the national trusts moves and changes in terms of how they are presenting the history at their sites there has from for example been a reactionary group who are uh displeased by quotes wokery namely I would argue telling the full story of the houses and the how the and the objects within them, and also where the money came to buy and build them. But that's you know I I do like a complete idea of a history of a place. That's just me though. Um, there has been there is a group that have formed. I don't want to say their name because they do seem to be funded allegedly by a interesting think tank. I use the term think very loosely. And I wonder if that's if that sort of group might have motivated this kind of behaviour. 
I mean, depending on who you ask, yes, Scarlett, it, it is, it is, it is, it is woke. Uh, it, apparently, I don't understand why. I find it very baffling. I um, it 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 very much confuses me. But um, what do I know? I only work in heritage sites every week of the year. <laughs> Um, so those are the updates, and I'm sure that we will have more in due course. Let's hop into the repatriation news. Australia has returned smuggled historical artefacts to China. So what we have here is a, in these pictures, we've got a Tang Dynasty era figurine of a rider of, on horseback blowing a wind instrument, not a euphemism, just FYI, it's quite small. I want to be clear about that. And then we've also got a gilt bronze figurine depicting a Buddhist deity whose name I cannot pronounce and I don't want to butcher. That's exactly the one, Scarlett. That is the think tank that I'm not going to name because I don't want any of them to get any publicity because they are the problem. They are the problem. These artefacts have been returned to Beijing. It, as well as the pictures, we, there is also a fossil of a Hyphalosaurus, a Hyphalosaurus. This is a long necked reptile species that lived in northeastern China between 120 and 133 million years ago. So, a not a dinosaur. Does that make it not a dinosaur? Questions. If it's got the name Saurus, that just means lizard, doesn't it? Answers on a postcard. <laughs> um, so this has, they were illegally exported from China to other countries before eventually ending up in Australia. No one has been prosecuted as there's no evidence that the importers in Australia knew that these objects had been illegally smuggled out. The... At this handover ceremony, there were also two other items that went back to the Ming and Qing dynasties that were given to China by the National Gallery of Australia and a private collector. Chinese state media reported that Australia and China have been working closely for the past three years to facilitate the return of illegally imported cultural relics, art items and fossils. So that's gone back. Hmm. It sometimes if my signal goes a bit skew if it can affect the uh, clarity of the image. But I am currently zooming into it on my little iPad and it's not. Um, it's not blurry for me. Oh, and that I should have pronounced that Sheen Dynasty. Apologies. The Sheen Dynasty. Thank you, Lizzie. The MFA, this is Boston's Museum of Fine Art, has surrendered two looted bronzes for repatriation back to Turkey. It's thought these pieces were looted in the 1960s. Back in September, the MFA said they were investigating the provenance of partial pieces of Roman statuary following the surrender of a bust that was estimated to be worth $5 million by the Worcester Art Museum. These pieces have both been given over to the Manhattan DA's office. So we're back with DA Bragg there. And the this the site where they think it's come from was looted in the 1960s. The fragments that have been returned are from ancient sculptures. We've got one is the right leg of a man. The other is a face described as a, quote, uh, Lizzie, please absolutely don't correct, don't apologise for correcting me. I didn't know how it was pronounced. Um, I and you, you told me politely, and thank you. And now I will know for the future. Absolutely no need. To, I there are a few things going on. I don't know how every word in the world is pronounced. I am embarrassed to say that I only really speak English fluently. I have the merest smattering of other languages. That's embarrassing. Um, and 
sometimes I just won't pronounce words right. I don't feel ashamed about the fact that I can't pronounce all of the words. I always say that if you don't know how to pronounce something, it usually means that you learnt it by reading. That's nothing to be ashamed of. I feel the same way about everybody. And if you could politely correct me, uh, then I can just learn and be better next time, can't I? So there's an absolute, please don't apologise. And if you see I've pronounced something wrong, then uh, then please tell me more. So we've got this, it's described as a, quote, personification or idealised Greek king. They think that the leg was likely part of a life-size statue of an emperor from the imperial sanctuary at Boubon. The face doesn't seem to come from the same statue as the leg, so different bits and pieces. And we're told in 1968, a dealer by the name of Jerome Eisenberg gave the leg to the MFA and then sold the faith to a private collector. Then the private collector gave the faith to the MFA in 2003. So, but since Boubon was not scientifically excavated until 1967, and these pieces came out in 1966, they were almost certainly illicitly removed before uh, they appeared on the market for the first time. So we will see what happens there. The Guardian is feeling very proud of itself, as we can see here. And this, I think, is interesting. The fact that The Guardian is choosing to publish this article and is claiming credit in the way they are, what that says to me is that, and granted, The Guardian is a more left-wing more left wing newspaper. So it's probably going to be one that's going to lean more towards the arguments for repatriation. However, when they are wearing it like this sort of a badge of honour, what that says to me is that the conversation is changing. And as more and more of the press sort of start to take pride in being the one that's influenced something to be repatriated, I think that's going to be another thing that's going to put pressure on institutions that aren't doing it. What we have here is, we are told, an Irish woman who has been inspired to return African and original antiquities because of a Guardian article. She had her late father's collection of 19th century African and Aboriginal objects, um, and she wants to have them returned to their countries of origin. And it was apparently, we're told, a Guardian article that inspired her to do so. The Isabella Walsh comes from Limerick. She has contacted embassies and consulates in Dublin and London with the hopes of repatriating 10 objects, including spears, harpoon heads and a shield, after she read about other cases in the newspaper. These objects once belonged to her father, who was an archaeologist and curator of the Limerick Museum. Babe, the things are supposed to be in the museum not in your house, but okay, um, who had apparently always cherished them due to his passionate interest in African and Aboriginal cultures. But he also believed that such objects belonged to the peoples from whom they had originated. It, it's it's one of those, I think that there are, there's a breed of collector and in many ways the, the children of those collectors now the ones doing the repatriation who were always conflicted there was the side of their brain that went oh shiny thing i like it must be mine my precious they were smeagling all over the place and then there was the part of their brain the kind of moral moral ethical heritage minded part of the brain that's like this isn't really mine but they were my preciousing it a little bit too much So she said, I appreciate and love the beauty of these objects and craftsmanship, but they are not culturally relevant to me. She said she had no idea how to repatriate the objects until she read a Guardian article in May about an American who had returned 30 antiquities to Italy. He was in, in turn inspired by another report about a man who sent back 19 antiquities to their countries of origin. So it seems that there's going there's a, a whole kind of collection of newspapers that are now claiming credit for the repatriation of objects. We are also told that each of them had turned for guidance to Dr. Christos Siriogannis, 
that is the academic who a few weeks ago we talked about he called out the Manhattan DA's office because they were using his research he was working with them using his research that is still uh, under a form of embargo because it could help if it was published it could help people evade capture or censure for smuggling artifacts so he can't in quotes profit from the work but he's also not being credited so th his name is now is coming up here in this as well um we are told over 17 years he has identified more than 1700 looted objects within auction houses commercial galleries private collections and museums he's alerted police to auth and authorities and governments and has helped to repatriate items he so she, Walsh wrote to him and said, I don't know how to go about this. Any advice or assistance you can offer would be a great help. And with his guidance, she is organising the return of the artefacts to Sudan, South Sudan, South Africa and Australia. So, I mean, he's just he's doing the thing. And I circling back to him being upset. It isn't about. It isn't simply about credit for credit's sake. As an academic whose work has such real world capacities and capabilities, the fact that his name isn't front and centre is really bad for his career. And it would it would be really simple just to name him. It that's wouldn't it? Because he's done so much so much important work. Seventeen hundred loose objects identified by him, which otherwise might have remained in private auction houses or you know never to be seen again or wherever else yes i i i think there are you know there i have when my husband has in the past when he's traveled to work he's you know brought back what i like to call guilt gifts and you know some of them are things from hand carved things that were purchased from market stalls etc i believe they that they are culturally significant art pieces but contemporary i think that if you are concerned that you have something that wasn't designed for the international marketplace at its time of creation if you have something that you believe may be culturally sensitive and culturally significant to a community then i think you can and i would argue perhaps should have that suspicion checked out and if the person from the consulate if the art historian says no you're good you're good that's that was designed for sale I mean, there are countless pieces of very, very, very old bone china that is obviously not was obviously not English or British made. However, it was made to be transported to here for sale. So just because something comes from overseas, it doesn't mean it has to go back. Um, there has been an import and export market for millennia. So those are those. There are, of course, caveats to everything. But I think if you're concerned that something you have maybe shouldn't be here, shouldn't be with you, then there is no harm in checking it out. And that's the thing, you know. There are there, as you rightly say, there were there were conflicts, many many conflicts, in the twentieth century, where items could have been misappropriated should we say stolen is what i do mean now this next one um was the was the, we are now on to the new news and i am going to talk about the article that i've avoided talking about it, we are about to talk about the giant spider giant dinosaur spider in between the last news and this one, I have received a message from somebody who has severe arachnophobia. 
So what I have decided to do is I have decided not to show the picture of the spider fossil because I don't want to upset anybody or trigger anybody's anxiety. As with everything, the article will be linked. So if you want to go and have a look at this creepy little eight-legged monster, you crack on. I am now going to talk about the dinosaur spider fossil. If the person who has the arachnid Arachnophobia, if anybody with arachnophobia, if me talking about it will be upsetting, then um, you can maybe mute uh, my video and I will flash my hand like this when I have stopped talking about it. Okay, so we're going to talk about the spiders now. Scientists have found a giant dinosaur spider fossil in Australia because of course they have because from everything I've heard about Australia it's trying to kill you um they have called this fossil Megamonodontium McCluskey which the surname is is it is the touch that I love it would have lived in the Miocene period 11 million to 16 million years ago we are told that only Four spider fossils have ever been found throughout the whole continent, which has made it, it's been quite difficult to for scientists to understand their evolutionary history. So this discovery is really significant because it does reveal new information about the extinction of spiders and it does fill a gap in our understanding of the past. We're told the close living relative of this fossil now lives in the wet forests of Singapore through to Papua New Guinea. So that's also, I'm just going to make a note of places that I'm never travelling to. So the in mental note, um, no Singapore, no forest in Singapore, no Papua New Guinea, because absolutely not today, you little spider Satan. Thank you very much. Whoa. Look, I know spiders do wonderful things for people. Like, they, they are great. I understand. But also, oh, oh, no. Um... Okay, uh, this one is five times larger than its modern day relatives. Its body is 23.31 millimetres long. That's its body, not including its legs. So it's just over an inch. Oh, oh. Um, uh, apparently this species also tells us thing of the uh, past climate of Australia. It was found in a layer of rainforest sediment, which means that this region was once, once much wetter than it now is. That could help, in turn help scientists understand how a warming climate has already altered the uh, country's life forms and how it might change them again. Um, not only is this the largest fossilised spider to be found in Australia, but it's the first fossil of the family Barry Chilady, I'm thinking that's how it's pronounced, that has been found worldwide. We are told that there are around 300 species of brush footed trapdoor spiders, which sounds cute, but isn't <coughs> at all. Um, but they don't seem to become fossils very often. And I wonder if that's because um, they are squishy. Is it is it not harder to fossilize something that's that's a squishy inside? <laughs> um, but they say that another reason they say is this could be because they spend so much time in inside burrows and so aren't in the right environment to be fossilized. Um, that is just its body. Its body is an inch. Then it's got its creepy legs. Mm! No, um, I was feeling better. Now the spider chat is making me feel weak. <laughs> I'm feeling weak. <sighs> that was my thought. They also say that but they do also say that the um, location they hang out in doesn't help too. So, um, for anybody who is an arachnophobe, we are going to change. The thing now, I'm going to flash this and then I'm going to flash my hand. We're done talking about spiders now. So, and uh, as I now know that we have got arachnophobes in the house, we will not show pictures of spiders either. We've got another another child arch 
archaeologist for our legion of incredible child archaeologists. This is an eight-year-old girl. She had discovered the bones of a woolly mammoth and a prehistoric bison uh, after a landslide along the banks of a river in western Russia. She found a set of mammoth leg bones as well as a vertebra from a prehistoric bison while she was fishing with her father on the shores of the Oka River, which is in western Russia. Apparently she's noticed a series of strange objects that have been unearthed by a recent landslide. And then her father sent photographs to a nearby museum in the hopes that they might be able to identify her discovery. Uh, they were, and that's how we know what she has now found. We're told that woolly mammoths were common in the frigid northern regions of Europe and Asia. And this was around 700,000 years ago. They were there later in North America, where they were there still around 100,000 years ago. In the region where these fossils were found, it's thought that mammoths might have persisted until about 10,000 years ago, which is the end of the Ice Age, and it caused these cold-adapted megafauna to lose their habitat and food sources. Oh, we're just on a little jump there. That's not helpful. The museum staff have urged, urged anybody else who finds fossils to come forward and to report them to scientific institutions. Many fossils do end up in private hands and are therefore unavailable for study. So it's if you are out and about, perhaps, I don't know, if you're in the UK, maybe you're down on the Jurassic Coast and you find something, nine times out of ten, you're going to find, um, you know, an, an ammonite or a coprolite that we have many, many existing samples of. Samples isn't the wrong. Specimens, that's the word I'm looking for. You know, that they're, you know if you find ammonite or a coprolite, chances are that there are a good few hundred thousand in museums up and down the country and across the world but if you see something you think that's a bit odd it's always worth pointing out because it may not be something that we that we that we already know about and if we don't know about it it could change the way we understand things so if you see something that you're like mm, this is interesting do let somebody know about it so Archaeologists have discovered amazing 7,000-year-old shark tooth knives in Indonesia. <clears throat> they have found two tiger shark teeth, estimated to be around 7,000 years old, that were fashioned into blades. This is a noteworthy find as it provides some of the earliest global evidence of shark teeth being used in composite weaponry. These weapons are not just older but they are also apparently more advanced than any previously discovered shark tooth blades the other ones are at least 2000 years their junior these shark tooth artifacts are attributed to the tolian culture a group that inhabited southwest sulawesi for several millennia these are hunter gatherers and they inhabited this island before neolithic, neolithic farmers spread into indonesia around 3500 years ago these teeth come from tiger sharks that were approximately two meters long. The teeth weren't, the sharks were, and they have distinctive perf perforations. We are told this attachment method that we found that they found on them where these um, holes have been made is similar to that used in contemporary shark tooth blade that's found in various Pacific islands. We're told that shark knives aren't that bad. And experimental reproductions show that these blades will effectively de uh, deliver quite deep cuts. Their sharpness also, though, does potentially make them able to go blunt fairly quickly. So it's thought that the use of them might be limited to special events or conflict rather than as kitchen knives. Um, we've got some pictures here of a shark tooth knife from our island, Papua New Guinea. And I mean, it does, it is very incredible. And it also looks like it would be very nasty. Weapons, including lances, knives, clubs, armed with shark teeth are known from mainland New Guinea to Micronesia, while lances form part of the mourning costume in Tahiti. 
While other shark tooth artifacts are much older, the Indonesian finds suggest a different story. These were not just decorative pieces, but had a functional, perhaps even a sacred role in society. And they are, they do look pretty cool, I've got to say. We have new discoveries at Tel Mohammed in Iraq. There's been a two month period of intensive archaeological research under the direction of the University of Katina, Kat, sorry, Katania, and its Department of Humanistic Studies, and also the Baghdad Urban Archaeological Project. They've been supported by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and they've also had international corporate cooperation. They suggest that the city's origin might trace back to the Paleo Babylonian era. This, the archaeological evidence indicates the city was abandoned during the fall of Babylon in 1595 BC. The primary focus of this investigation, excavation campaign, was to unearth the intricate system of fortifications and water management that marked the city's northeastern side. Over the course of these excavations, they have found a section of the surrounding wall demarcating a canal or even a river port along the it's, it's tigris isn't it rather than tigris the tigris river could be wrong there the entrance they found led to a complex system featuring a staircase ascending to a sizable elevated terrace with an adjacent tower uh, as well as a canal that was integral to the city's intricate sewage system Within the city walls, they've unveiled structures associated with grain processing, bread making. They found ovens with dual purposes, including the liquefaction of bitumen, which was essential for waterproofing vessels and water management facilities. They've also found a bathroom with an underlying latrine and a sacred space containing an altar tombs that was dedicated to the cult of ancestors known as Kispum in Babylonian. We have some ceramic forms from the Paleo-Babylonian era that are photographed here and three valuable cylindrical seals that they think had administrative functions also that were also found. And these display iconography and inscriptions typical of that period. As well as the seals, there are terracotta votive plaques adorned with female imagery, models of beds linked to sacred marriage and figurines of musicians were also discovered, all representing elements of the Babylonian tradition from the early second millennium BC. I'm seeing some interesting Australia slander in the chat. It, I mean, Australia looks incredibly beautiful, but when I see people putting on their shoes and they tap them out because you don't know what's got in there. No, thank you. I mean, we have creepy crawlies here. We have snakes. We have spiders. There is there is nothing, nothing that can kill you. Like, no, nothing's got a sting in its bum that can kill you. There isn't a venomous snake. The spiders are fine. No, nothing's trying to get you here. We've got a 5,000-year-old mother goddess statuette unearthed in Yesilova yes, 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 Mound. Uh, this is in the Bornova di district. This contains the ruins of the oldest settlement in Izmir. The mound itself dates back 8,500 years, and it's being excavated and has already revealed some critical traces from the Neolithic age. This excavation has been in progress since 2005 and it was announced that at the height of this, the, the 5,000 year old goddess figurine made of terracotta was 10 centimetres. We are told that similar pieces can be found in the Fermi region on Lesbos in the Aegean Sea, but this piece dates back to 500 years earlier than those on Lesbos. And this discovery suggests a cultural exchange that extended towards the northern Aegean island and even into the Balkans. The Great Mother Goddess is a representation of the nurturing aspect of the divine feminine. It connects to ideas of creation and fertility, and this is something that preempts and, and predates the patriarchal religions that would later gain dominance. 
the goddess religion was instead the one that was practiced in many parts of the world. Mother goddess is also known as Mother Earth. It's a matriarchal archetype found frequently in ancient art and various other mythologies. So this is a very beautiful thing to have been found, I think. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, we have got an ancient Egyptian cemetery that holds a rare book of the dead, a papyrus from that, and also mummies. Archaeologists have discovered a 3,500-year-old cemetery that we are told contains a book of the dead papyrus. This is the cemetery at Tuna al Gabal in central Egypt. It dates back to the New Kingdom, which is circa 1550 to 1070 BCE. In it, they have found mummies, sarcophagi, amulets, and numerous shabti, also called ushabti figurines, which were meant to serve the deceased in, uh, in the afterlife. The Book of the Dead Papyrus that was found is approximately 43 to 49 feet or 13 metres to 15 metres long. This site has been being excavated since 2017. Uh, the Book of the Dead, we're told, is the modern name that's given to a variety of texts that served a number of purposes, including helping the dead to navigate the underworld. So this has been found. We aren't sure. It's not clear what exact text this Book of the Dead contains or with whom it was buried. No photographs of this particular Book of the Dead papyrus have been released, and members of the team that discovered it have not responded to requests for comment. I don't know if that's normal. I'll be honest. I don't know what the what the protocol is with photographing an item like that. It's of course it's possible. So it's possible that it's culturally insensitive for that to happen, or it might be that what's contained upon it is so groundbreaking and so new that they're holding back until they can get a peer-reviewed article out, maybe. Um, but scholars who were not involved in the excavation said that this find could be important. We are told it's very rare to find a copy of the Book of the, of the Dead in a grave where it was originally buried. We're told, quote, without photographs, it's hard to say more, and it's customary to wait for some form of official publication to form solid assessments. So they are holding off for some reason, which in some ways whets my appetite even further. We're told that the cemeteries also contained many canopic jars that would have held the organs of the, of the deceased and that the remains of stone sarcophagi, which held the wooden coffins of the deceased, were also found. These excavations and analysis of the remains are still ongoing. I thought this looked really cool. This is an intricately adorned tomb of a rare uh, pharaonic scribe that has been found in Egypt by Czech archaeologists working in the Abu Sir area of Egypt. And it's just, the carvings on the wall are so beautiful. And I mean, the way it's been lit for this photograph is also phenomenal. There's been an in-depth examination of skeletal remains found. And it's decided, it's been revealed that Jehiti Imat, whose existence dates back to approximately the first millennium BC, had passed away at just 25. Um, the analysis also disclosed that he had a, even at this young age, he had a severe case of osteoporosis. This burial chamber is contains incredibly intricate scenes and hieroglyphics. It's been referred to as a well-shaped chamber culminating in a burial room. Sorry, <coughs> my voice is going a bit. A, a well-shaped chamber culminating in a burial room. Um, we're told that... Oh. The area of the necropolis, necropolis where the tomb was unearthed had previously revealed the ancient burials of distinguished officials and also military leaders. So it's it's part of something, a wider complex. It does just look 
absolutely incredible. But that's, of course, not the only cool tomb that's been found recently, because we also have this untouched Etruscan tomb in Vulci Archaeological Park, central Italy. This is a 2,600-year-old intact double-chambered Etruscan tomb found in April that has remained untouched before that, and it's just recently been opened. And the tomb is a, contains a rich collection of pottery, amphorae, uh, utensils, cups, and a bronze cauldron. All of these objects are, we are told, in excellent condition, including apparently a tablecloth that was used in the Etruscan religious rite ritual of the last meal, a food offering that was burned inside the tomb before it was sealed. And the tomb is very large. It's a double chambered tomb carved into the tuff uh, and it's thus archaeological no archaeologically noteworthy we can see they've also obviously found these series of jars and jugs the archaeologists found a large tomb with two chambers dug into the soft Quranic tufa tuffer uh, the first chamber contained four etruscan transport amphora for local wine the second chamber contained amphora and ceramics from eastern Greece, Ionia, Corinth, and local production, including black buchero pottery. It's thought that the two amphora in, in chamber B came from the island of Chios, the most prized wine in the Greco-Roman world. Also, a tripod bowl and iron objects were found in chamber B. It's reported that, quote, appears to be characterised by a septum speared in, spared in the rock that creates an archway between the dromos, that is, the short corridor with steps, and the vestibule from which there was access to the two chambers, the front and the left. The one, usual, on the right is missing, evidently because the space had already been occupied by other tombs. So, that's very cool. Very cool. I know, right? Like the from what what we're hearing, the quality of these finds, the quality of these finds is incredible. Are we just just? I've seen I've seen the mention of the of the phrase aconite. We aren't we're not sharing tips, are we? Because this is the public internet, and this could be used as evidence in a court of law. <laughs> Divorce is relatively affordable, just saying. Um, <laughs> we've got a spectacular hall used by Nordic Bronze Age royalty, We set, they think, that's been unearthed in Germany. This was built uh, roughly 3,000 years ago. Um, a floor plan stretching 102 by 33 feet, which is 31 by 10 metres. And the enormous structure located near what is now Berlin, it's the largest known ancient construction of its kind in the region. Quote, we were overwhelmed by how big this building must have been. Uh, this is an archaeologist at Georg August University in Gottingen, in Germany. Researchers have dubbed this a spectacular find. They think that this building once served as a meeting hall for King Hinz, the ruler of Prignitz, which is now a district in northern Germany. Allegedly, he was buried in a golden coffin. I've never heard about him. He sounds cool. Not much has been written about this king, whose story does apparently remain a mystery to this day. Um, with further investigation, it's been revealed that the bill's, building's walls were made using planks of wood and wattle and daub. And it's thought this building's height, which measured 23 feet or 7 metres, this building contained multiple stories. Uh, in addition to the remaining hall, archaeologists unearthed a century located fireplace and miniature vessel possibly used for, for rituals. 
the structure sits in the same area as a cemetery, which was discovered by workers in 1899 during a road construction project. Apparently only two other buildings of this site have ever been found between Germany and Denmark. See, I trust you to an extent. Um, but it's I, when I when I spot something in the comment in the chat, I'm like, hang on a minute. I was just looking at an article and now we're talking. Talking about aconite, uh, probably should just dip in and uh, protect myself legal wise. No, it is not. It is not. This is so cool. So cool. 3D scans, we're told, will uncover the secrets of Iron Age, Iron Age gold trevor. Treasure. Look at these gorgeous coins. They uh, they have been folded. They they say uh, deliberately. Um, apparently, uh, the journalists were waiting. An armored car draws up in tenth February twenty twenty two. A brown shoebox comes out, held by the archaeologist from the Danish Museum. Uh, who then takes it through a revolving door into the 3D imaging center. In there was the world's largest bracteate. This is a medallion-like medallion -like necklace measuring 13.5 centimeters that was found along with 15 other bracteates and four Roman, Roman medallions by an amateur archaeologist in the year before in a field <coughs> pardon me, in Denmark. The issue is many of the bracteates are folded to a point where you can't see the motifs or the runic inscriptions in them. It's, however, too risky to unfold the gold by hand, but there is the help of modern tech at the DTU. We're told that sometimes technology, can't, technology can open doors that we can't. In this case, you can get a better look at the inscriptions. So I think the plan is to kind of digitally unfold it, I'm going to say. We're told that in Denmark at the time of Bracteates, it can best be, be described as what the Germans called Wild Germania, where autocratic clan leaders ruled marked territories according to the same rules used by biker gangs or the mafia. So like modern government there. And good, good. Uh, the more they won, the stronger the clan leaders they became, the more gold and riches they could uh, get for their followers, the more followers they got. Judging by the size of this treasure, it's thought that the owner must have been a very powerful, previously unknown clan leader. So hopefully more stuff will uh, come out about them. There is a theory that there was a close connection, potentially an alliance between two clan leaders at two centres of power. Possibly this gold was handed over as a gift in connection with the weddings between daughters and sons from each clan. So almost something like a dowry, maybe. It's very important thus to see the motifs on the largest of the gold bracteates, which seems to have been folded, have a folded twin motif in the middle. The stamps around the motif can also tell the researchers something about the origin of the Bracteate and how old it is. If they turn out to bear the same stamps as the ones found in Goodme or Godme, then they were made by the same goldsmiths. We're told, quote, it's a bit like a court case where the more circumstantial evidence we find, the stronger the case will be. We can't exactly ask the witnesses who were there at the time. We rely on the circ circumstantial evidence. And that's where this new technology can help. The hope is that they can piece together the individual parts after it's been digitally unfolded. And by seeing what the motif actually looks like when it was flat, they can perhaps tell who made it or who it was made for, uh, and this can draw conclusions about it changing hands and why, maybe even why it was folded. And in so doing, perhaps we get a story, a bit more of a story about the culture uh, at play at this time. Archaeologists have found a submerged stoa complex in Greece. This is the east on the east coast of Salamis, the largest Greek island uh, in the Saronic Gulf. 
they found a large, long, narrow public building that's been partially submerged underwater. This is near the site of one of the most important naval battles in history, the Battle of Salamis of 480 BC. So marine archaeologists have been investigating the waters uh, around this area. And excavations in the former landslide of the seawall have revealed a public building identified as a stoa. The meaning of stoa is an ancient Greek portico, usually walled at the back with a front colonnade designed to offer a sheltered promenade. It's a place for the activities of civil magistrates, shopkeepers and others, but stoas also often served as galleries for art and public monuments. They were used for religious purposes, a delineated public space. And what a brilliant location for it as well, right, right on the coast. <laughs> Um, various artifacts and objects have been discovered. There have been classical Hellen Hellenistic period ceramics, amphora stoppers, fragments of marble objects, and 22 bronze coins. Two of the marble objects found are particularly significant, dating from the 4th century BC. The first is a column with a fragmentary verse inscription. The second is a stele with a muscular right hand of a large figure. The stele matches a marble stele from around 320 BC that is currently housed in Salamis Archaeological Museum. We're told that the stoa is open to the west and probably marks the eastern boundary of the Agora area of the classical Hellen Hellenistic city rather than the port, extending on the generally level ground to the west-northwest of the building. We are told that the ruins of this were seen and described by the traveller Porcianus, Porcianus around the middle of the second century. And that research is the, this is the first interdisciplinary underwater research that's been carried out intensively since 2016. So we will see what uh, other things come from this study, but how fascinating. We have got a majestic Minoan palace that's been uncovered on Crete. They think this possibly served as a summer residence for the kings and elite of nearby Knossos. Uh, the Greek Ministry of Culture announced on Thursday that excavations at the site of the, quote, shining palace added many new facts about the building and completed our knowledge of its architecture and construction. The, the post, perhaps the most interesting element is the discovery of the use of a shiny material, gypsum, in the construction. Gypsum is a soft mineral and it can form pretty, sometimes extremely large, coloured crystals. And what have we got here? The Greek Ministry of Culture has said that another new element discovered in the excavations was the point where a fire started, which resulted in the destruction of much of the palace. They've also found about 20 large jars containing, containing wine, oil, and even tax, textiles were found gathered together, as well as special vases for perfume and an Egyptian scarab. In an excavated area that they think was a once a sanctuary, they found a number of vessels that they've, they've uncovered. They've got a crystal vessel, a grey one of incised steatite, steatite? as well as fragments of obsidian. This is volcanic glass that uh, can be gathered when lava extrudes from a volcano and then cools rapidly and has limited crystal growth. They found parts of microscopic samples of large vessels in the sanctuary. They found a sea newt, which a ritual find of a sea newt, an instrument for in invoking a larger deity, sea pebbles, symbolising the deity's marine status, were also found. They've got slabs of hewn ashlars there as well. The walls were preserved at a height of two metres, are thinly plastered. Fragments of delicate mortars, red, blue and black, show that they would bear frescoes, which they plan to carefully remove later. This city where this Minoan palace is being excavated is the city of Arcanes, which was an, an important city for the Minoans, established in 
the established last century, <clears throat> the importance of this place was found when Sir Arthur Evans characterised the site as palatial, saying that it was likely a summer palace for the Knossos kings. Earlier excavations have unearthed features such as ashlar blocks, limestone plaques and blocks, plaster, wood, stucco floor tiles, gypsum, mud bricks, ironstone blocks, blue marble flooring, carved concave altars, frescoes and doorways. Um, they've also got a variety of porphyrite stone lamps, vases, amphora, cooking pots, cups, lamps, tools and other domestic items such as tweezers. There is going to be a new museum and uh, things will, the ancient treasures will be exhibited at the new museum. I think I'm okay. I'm just, it's, uh, the talking will be, we'll get there. I'm, I'm mostly fine. I think my husband may have fallen asleep putting the baby to bed. When he wakes up, he will fetch me tea. That is what will happen. <laughs> right. Look, look at this. That... That is a in that hole stacked is a pile of over a hundred thousand coins, some of which are more than two thousand years old. Isn't it cool? So this is in Japan. This excavation was prompted by the construction of a new factory. In this collection of coins, they've got the Ban Liang, which is a coin from 175 BCE, uh, China's first unified currency. They've also got coins dating from the 7th to the 13th century. These coins were bundled in groups of around 100 coins and secured with straw cords known as sashi. It's thought that these coins were buried quickly because the location was close to opulent homes belonging to influential people in medieval Japan, perhaps because of it as a precaution against an impending war. The unearthed coins were found in an area approximately 60 centimetres high and one metre wide, with a staggering 1,060 bundles of these sashi clusters. Some bundles contained evidence of 10 sashi, equivalent to roughly a thousand coins, all arranged with traces of rice straw mats. A thorough examination of 334 coins from the hall revealed an astounding variety of 44 currency types. Coins dating as far back as China's Western Han Dynasty, extending to the Southern Song Dynasty. The oldest among them, that Ban Liang, dates to 175 BC. This is a seven millimeter, it's got a seven millimeter square hole in the center of a 2.3 centimeter diameter coin. It's a thickness of one millimeter. The most recent coin in the trove was minted in 1265 during the Southern Song Dynasty. So it's thought that these coins were hidden during the turbulent Kamakura period between 1185 and 1333. What I think is also interesting is clearly how long coins are in circulation does that not with a with some of the coins being that old and some the kind of length of time between those coins that points to is recoinage not common like it is in europe the archaeological site is part of an area encompassing approximately one kilometer uh, including social burial mounds and the Sano temple ruins. This indicates the region's prominence as a centre of activity from the late Kofun period to the Ritsuryo period. period. The artefacts from the Sosha village East 03 site are currently on display at the, quote, newly excavated cultural artefacts exhibition 2023. This open to the public it was open to the public until the 12th of this month. That event was free to attend. Hopefully, it will come back on display because what an, what an incredible collection of things. A 2,000-year-old Roman decorated sandal has been unearthed in Spain. It's thought that a person was cleaning out a well in Roman Spain 
when one of their sandals slipped off their foot. And now this missing shoe has been found. It was found this summer when people were excavating a Roman settlement in northern Spain. With help of a pulley system, researchers successfully accessed the depths of this stone lined well. We are told that the, they were impressed with the shoe's craftsmanship, its level of detail, especially on its sole, which is decorated with a profusion of circles, loops, ovals and other motifs. It's made of a dark brown level leather. The front of the shoe, we're told, shows negative stitching. The sandal, we're told, is pres well preserved because of the abundance of mud that was in the well. And this uh, this kind of preservation is a rarity in the region. Indeed, the preservation of organic materials full stop is rare. So they're dealing with the well for water consumption in a private house. And that's one of the reasons for its excellent preservation, because of the anaerobic state of the deposit. The materials have remained intact for 2,000 years because of a lack of oxygen. Other notable artefacts to be found in the well were ceramic jars, seeds, nuts, shells, a small metal ring, a necklace, beads and a bronze vessel. Quote, we were also fortunate enough to recover several of the house's landfill sites. So we now have a complete knowledge of its household goods, glass crockery. Gallic and Hispanic stigilata, stigilata or tableware and fine South Gallic thin-walled pottery, refractory dishes, commonware, local ceramics, jewellery, coins and working tools. In short, almost everything that allows us to make a good reconstruction of what this house must have been like in the early imperial period. We're told that it's thought likely that they are dealing with people with a high level of purchasing power as the materials they're recovering show a high level of commerce. And it sounds like they've really got such an incredible collection of finds. I look forward to hopefully seeing them perhaps in an exhibition. Courtine Hall, a silver bracelet find, offers a glimpse into the Roman past. We have once again a Roman find or a find in general being found by a metal detectorist. The metal detectorist in question is a gentleman called Phil Craddock. He made this find in Northamptonshire of this bracelet, which has been declared treasure and claimed by Northampton Museum and Art Gallery. Mr. Craddock, who, whose day job is as a trade driver for London Northwestern, described realising this bracelet's age and importance as a fantastic feeling. He said, quote, I found numerous items over the years that give a fantastic overview of Courtine Hall estate's historic past from the early Celtic Roman periods through to the present day. He drives past this estate on the train and often spots fields that he wants to explore. And good for him for having done so. This bracelet was found a few inches beneath a few inches of soil at a private estate near Northampton, which is near to an 18th century hall. Other, other finds that he has made include an 800-year-old gold ring, a Stone Age axe, a Bronze Age spear, uh, medieval buckles and coins dating back to 20 AD. He said, when you wipe away the soil and realise you found something that hasn't been seen for thousands of years, it's a fantastic feeling. How cool is that? We're told that archaeologists have uncovered a structure linked to the cult of Kukulkan. 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 This is at the capital of the Alcalan Maya people, located in the Yucatan Peninsula in the Mexican state of Campeche. This early centre dates from the late Maya pre classic period while the majority of structures that are signed today were constructed during the early classic period. In the year 1525, Hernan Cortes briefly visited the city during his exhibition to Honduras. The excavations have explored a circular structure which dates from between AD 1000 to 12,000. Researchers have said that it's linked to the cult of Kukulkan, 
a related Aztec who's related to the Aztec wind god Quetzalcoatl. I apologize for the terrible pronunciation of those things. The these cults mark a significant departure from the traditional linguistic and ethnic boundaries of the Mesoamerican world during the classic period. This religious movement, we're told, uh, played a pivotal role in fostering communication and harmonious trade among diverse groups with varying social and ethnic backgrounds. According to researchers, this structure corresponds with the period recording in the historical text at a time when its um, Kanak had tied with other regions of Mesoamerica, such as central Mexico, Oaxaca, Oaxaca, and the Gulf Coast. Fabulous. Fabulous. I was I always put this in with the updates because I think I, I'm pretty sure, but not a hundred percent, that we have talked about this new port ship. But I wasn't sure if we had, so I put it in here. Because if we did, we talked about it ages ago. They have done tree ring analysis in order to date a medieval ship that's been found in a Welsh riverbank. And they've been able to date this to within a few months. This wreck is a 15th century ship found in the mud of Newport's River Usk in 2002. And it's said to be a find as significant as the Mary Rose. They have dated the timbers and it's from oak trees that were fell, felled in the winter of 1457 to 1458. They, an 8 million project finished earlier this year to conserve 2,500 pieces of wood from this ship that were uncovered. They believe that this 30 metre or 98 foot, 400 ton, medium sized boat was having a refit in Newport in 1468 or 1469, having returned from the Iberian Peninsula to Bristol. It collapsed into an inlet, they think, in the River Usk. Its 25 ton hull was found more than 550 years later, preserved in a wet, muddy riverbank. Dan Snower said this Newport ship was, quote, one of the most interesting and important shipwrecks found in British waters in a generation, that it's of global significance and interest. No, this is not the wreck with the dresses. That's a different wreck that I can't remember the name of. This is a different wreck to that. And I mispronounced that. That is pronounced Oaxaca. Like the Mexican food restaurant, is that what they 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 spell out? They spell that phonetically for us, don't they? Oaxaca. Thank you very much. Shane, don't pick on me vicariously. We're told that this Newport ship, ship has been through a lot. It's been underground for 500 years. It's gone through cleaning, conservation. It's been soaked in wax and freeze-dried. And yet the isotope signatures are still in the tree rings. The Newport ship, this, this is a great find. <coughs> because it also tells that they could do it to other vessels and timber structures that they previously, previously didn't date with traditional ring dendrochronology. They can now be dated with oxygen isotope or stable isotope dendrochronology. This oxygen isotope dendrochronology has been used to estimate when the timbers were harvested. It's been called revolutionary in the development of dating wood. It's like they've said it's like the advent of DNA technology in criminology. This process is only five to ten years old. It's a complex process that takes a long time, days and days of work and a lot of resources, but it is a game changer for archaeologists and it's a significant innovation. And how fascinating is that? New tech all the time. Now, this article I think is super cool. They have found human remains, medieval human remains, in a 15th century burial in Germany 
with a prosthetic hand. This was made, there's a new pipeline being laid near the Church of St. George, and so there were excavation works. When doing so, they found this. It's a sophisticated construction made of iron and non-ferrous metal. It dates to, the, the individual in the grave dates to 30 to 50 years old when they died, sometime between 1450 and 1620. There were, we're told, many conflicts in Central Europe during this period. So is this possible a war wound that's been uh, given a prosthetic hand? We're told that there are approximately 50 known prosthetic devices from the late Middle Ages and the early modern period in Central Europe. These prosthetics vary, encompassing both basic non-articulated models and a more complicated one with mechanical components. Quote, the hollow hand prosthesis on the left hand added four fingers. The index, middle, ring and little fingers are individually formed from sheet metal and are immovable. The finger replicas lie parallel to each other, slightly curved. The prosthesis is probably tied to the stump of the hand with straps. How cool is that? Just fabulous, isn't it? So index, middle, ring and little formed of sheet metal and are immovable. So the question was, was the thumb still there or has that been lost? Really interesting. What a, and, the, and I think it's just the thing that, you know, the time is taken. The time is taken to give the visual appearance of there being no difference. Presumably because some, and somebody obviously wanted that and felt that was had become such a part of them, and those that cared for them after death felt that that prosthesis had become a, such a part of them that it should be buried with them, which I think is very telling. That 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 actually it goes beyond being purely functional in the world. That they they still they saw it as part of their loved one when they put them when they buried them. A diver has discovered tens of thousands of ancient coins off the coast of Italy. I'll just back on that last point. Biz worked at a physical rehab and has seen the added functionality of prosthetic devices. Oh, absolutely. I think what's interesting is from the description of this one where all the fingers are fused. I mean, of course, there could have been some usefulness to it, but there's, there's obviously there's no articulation. <coughs> so at least in part, it must have been about the appearance of balance, I suppose. But prosthetics are incredible, so incredible. They have found tens of thousands of 4th century bronze coins off the coast of Sardinia. Uh, authorities received a tip from a diver who spotted something shiny near the island's northern shore. Official sent a team of divers to scope out the scene and um, just one quick. Uh, I did, I did not include, so I did, I did, I did talk about it. I did not include images of it. I also warned before I spoke about it and gave a visual sign when it was over. It is further back, it is earlier, um, and maybe if somebody's prepared to timestamp things, they can flag that up. I will at some point figure out how I can timestamp things, but I, I can't do that right now. Um, they found these ancient cane, coins known as follies. They were poking up from the sea floor. They used a metal detector to locate the artifacts, brushing away the sand with their hands. They then put the coins in large red bins and hold them up to the surface. Incredible. They haven't got the exact number of coins that they've recovered. They don't know yet, but it's between 30,000 and 50,000 based upon object weight. The coins are said to be exceptional and rare in their state of conservation. And the four are damaged, but even the four that are damaged have inscriptions that are still legible. They also found amphora and 
a this treasure trove was found in a large sandy area between the beach and underwater seagrass. They think that perhaps a shipwreck could be concealed nearby. So no doubt more things will be investigated. Due to the markings of the coins, it's thought that they date between 324 and 340 CE. Some objects depict Constantine I, who was the Roman emperor between, between 306 and 337 CE. These recovered coins come from mints that were located across the Roman Empire. The plan is to restore and study the coins in the hopes of learning more about their origins. We are told these coins also highlight, quote, the richness and importance of the archaeological heritage that the depths of our seas, crossed by men and goods since the most ancient of times, still guards and conserves. So, more sea stuff to do in safety. Next up, something very not safe. Dozens of centuries old stone. I don't know if I can say that word. Centuries old stone boom boom devices from Ming Dynasty have been discovered at the Great Wall of China. This is a cache of 400-year-old stone boom-booms that were inscribed with orders warning guards to watch out for enemies. They've been discovered at the Great Wall of China. This finding, we're told, has shows the astonishing variety of early gunpowder weapons that were used during the Ming Dynasty, which ruled China from 368 to 16, from 1368 to 1644. Um, Antonio Andrade says, quote, I've argued that the Ming Dynasty was the world's first, quote, gunpowder empire. Gunpowder is thought to have been invented in China in the 900s. And by the time this dynasty started, many types of gunpowder weapons were already being in use in East Asia. Um, they have explosive devices with fancy names such as flying rats, fire bricks, caltrop fireballs, 10,000 fire flying sand magic bomb, 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 boom, booms, boom, booms. Um, boom, booms were one of the first it, it apps made from either stone or iron. I don't know. I, uh, you never know what you're allowed to say when it comes to things like this. These, uh, 59 of these stone boom booms were found in the ruins of a storehouse beside the Badaling Great Wall, a section of the wall built by the Ming Dynasty that's about 50 miles northwest of modern, the modern Chinese capital. Uh, no photographs have been released of these objects yet, but they are probably uh, similar to the, the handheld thunder crash boom booms made with pottery shells in China at about the same time. These, the ones found at Badaling are made of stone with a hole drilled out of the centre to fill the fill it with boom powder. These, it's said that these are similar to stone boom booms found previously. Uh, they were a common weapon for guards along the Great Wall during the Ming Dynasty. After being found with boom, filled with boom powder, these boom booms could be sealed and thrown and not only hit the enemy, but cause a boom. Um, saying the word boom a lot, aren't I? He added that the first time such a storehouse of weapons had been found along the Great Wall. Archaeologists have also announced the discovery of the remains of a stone fort near the wall in this area, as well as fire pits, stoves, shovels, and utensils amid the remains of the wall's defensive towers. Oh, okay. Okay. You never know, because th some things that you think probably should be censored are not, and some things that are like a bit, you know, a bit like, oh, kind of get over it. They get a bit eggy about it. An incontained teenager who was part of a ritual sacrifice 500 years ago has had her face reconstructed. 
Beautiful. Called the Inca Ice Maiden. This is what she might have looked like when she was still alive. This is a lifelike silicone bust, and it's been unveiled at the Andean Sanctuaries Museum of the Catholic University of Santa Maria in Peru. It's, part, it's on display as part of a temporary exhibition at the museum where the mummy is also housed. <laughs> the mummy, also nicknamed Juanita or Ad Lady of Ampato, was found in 1995. Through the girl's colourful alpaca, well robed, dark hair, teeth and fingernails were well preserved. Her face has been exposed to the elements and has largely disappeared. Her remains have been studied to learn more about her life. They think she was between 13 and 15 years old and that she passed away between 1440 and 1450 CE. They measure her in at about four foot six, weighing around 77 pounds. The cause of her demise was a bash to the head. Um, so her face has been reconstructed. It's taken about 400 hours for this reconstruction to take place. The ritual that they think took her life is called Capacocha, which mostly involves sacrificing children and animals who were offered to gods in response to natural disasters to consolidate state, state power in far-flung provinces of the Inca Empire or simply to please the deities. It's thought that the girls' community likely considered her selection an honour and because they found ash nearby, they think that she might have been sacrificed after a volcanic um, eruption. Researchers have found the remains of more than a dozen Incan human sacrifices in the Andes, including three child mummies on top of the Lulalilico volcano. There's probably too many L's in the way I pronounce that. It's which is at the Chilean-Argentinian border. Testing later revealed that one of the children, a 13-year-old girl, had been heavily sedated at the time of death. And in the months leading up to the sacrifice, all of the children had consumed alcohol and coca leaves, substances that were typically reserved for the Inca elite. Well, I'm I'm uh, pleased that they m might have been out of their box when all this was going on. It's the one small mercy. <coughs> Not Pete's, not the Leaning Tower of Pisa, but a different Leaning Tower in Italy. This is a Leaning Tower in Bologna. Uh, there is a fear that it might be subsiding. Streets around the Garicenda, which is one of Bologna's twin towers, perched together in the city centre, have been sealed off as scientists are monitoring the monument for evidence that the structure is cracking and moving. This 48 metre or 158 foot tower was built in the 12th century. Um, it was, <coughs> however, shortened in later years. And it now sits in the city centre uh, beside the Azinelli, a tower twice as height which tourists can climb. City Mayor Matteo Lepore blocked off the area around the towers at the weekend after meeting with the city's heritage superintendent and the Committee of Scientists, which has been monitoring this pair of towers since 2018, so they could conduct further monitoring and install sensors. They are checking on the health of the structure. Sensors have been placed around the towers to monitor any stress noise, cracks or creaks. A pendulum has also been installed to track movement. Visitor access has been halted, and a pendulum will also be installed in the higher tower. Turning the area into a pedestrian zone is less about immediate safety concerns and more about allowing the instruments to gather more precise data. Tests are going to continue. They have been continuing for the rest of that week uh, to see what the tower is doing. This tower has been leaning for several centuries and it has been the subject of various interventions over the decades. So uh, the roads were closed until that Friday. <coughs> Um, I'm assuming it has reopened. I will check out for I will check for any updates on this uh, as to when I can, and see if there has been any further news on what on what the findings of these tests are. 
all we are we are told that safety is always important and there's a need to investigate but people at the time of the town don't believe the tower is going to fall down famous famous last words see this is my question as well with 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 coins doing the rounds because i think while there probably are coins of old monarchs across europe and across the Roman Empire, I suppose, how far back? Because ultimately, when a coin has been in circulation for a while, it 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 does start to wear down. And as coins come into the royal coffers, if they don't have the they don't bear the face of the current monarch or the monarch from the time before, they will be recoined when they make their way back into royal hands. So I'm just wondering how long could a old coin how many generations how many reigns back could an old coin be allowed to exist for yes and i think the thing is that of course just because the coins are recalled it doesn't mean they actually turn up so i'm just i'm wondering like obviously it's really it's gonna be it's, it's obviously it's impossible to answer this question but i wonder how how far back could the oldest coin be or might the oldest coin be that could still be in circulation? I suppose it's as, it's as old as it it's as old as it gets to, isn't it? A homeowner who was planning to throw away this painting in her kitchen has not, fortunately, because it did turn out to be a 13th century masterpiece that is worth $25 million. That must have been a shock. The Louvre has acquired this 13th century masterpiece as it was discarded as worthless. It was discovered hanging in a kitchen during a house clearance in provincial France. Um, it's called Christ Mocked. It's by the Florentine master uh, Simboe. Simbu, uh, it's now been declared a national treasure. It was originally thought to have been of no value. Uh, the, uh, the owner, a woman in her 90s, was unaware that she had been looking at this treasure every day, thinking that it was instead a worthless icon from, from Russia. Uh, I mean, if I wasn't in a, in a new build, so would I, babe, for sure. The buyers, Chilean billionaires, Alvero Sayer Bendik, an, an economist, and his wife, Anna Guzman Anfeld, an architect, bought it for their private collection. However, they were hit by a roadblock when the French government denied the painting an export license because they recognised the cultural significance of the masterpiece. Um, so they are they they stopped the export from happening. This is going to be alongside another Simbue painting. It's going to be the subject of a 2025 spring ex. I'm assuming this is going to need a lot of cleaning. It was in a kitchen, unframed. Unframed. Um, scholars believe this piece dates to 1280. So uh, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, uh, it's, I'm sure it's going to look absolutely beautiful when it's been fully restored and goes on display in 2025. A holy grail of shipwrecks worth 33 billion New Zealand dollars is going to be raised from the seabed. 300 years after the British Navy sank it. This was the galleon San Jose, part of the fleet of King Philip V, sunk by the Royal Navy in 1708 during the Spanish Royal Succession. When she sank, she was said to be laden with loot, including emeralds, millions of solid gold coins. This wreck is currently lying in the Caribbean Sea, close to the port city of Cartagena, uh, 
the plan is Colombia is ramping up its efforts to raise the ship and cash in on the billions of dollars. This, it, the hope is that they're going to be able to bring this 62 gun, three masted ship to the surface before the uh, before this presidential term is up. The before the before the, and the Minister of Culture uh, gets re-elected or not. So the president has basically told them to pick up the pace. He wants he wants this to be the marker of his presidency. Spain, citing UNESCO convention, has claimed rights to the destroyed ship since it belonged to the Spanish Navy three centuries ago. The Quara Quara indigenous group in present day Bolivia said they should get the treasure since Spanish colon <coughs> pardon me since Spanish colonizers forced their ancestors to mine some of the precious metals they say were aboard. Colombia also faces a ten US US ten billion claim from the US company Glockamora, which claims to have discovered the wreck in nineteen eighty one and had the coordinates to the Colombian government on the promise of half the cargo's value. Colombia claims the search of the coordinates produced nothing, but the company, now called Sea Search Armada, believes the country found the wreck in the same debris field it had discovered 33 years, uh, 34 years earlier. So, seems like raising this from the seabed is going to be very expensive. I hope they're going to plan to not just rip out all of the gold from that hole, but also try to preserve the ship as best they can. But it sounds like it's going to be decades, decades and decades of infighting about who gets what. Oh, yeah, this is not going to be this is not going to be a quiet moment. This is going to be a full blown row for sure. Uh, we have got some new technology, news of new technology, protecting shipwrecks underwater. They are going to be able to scientifically mark UK artefacts underwater so that if parts of them are stolen, the thief can be linked back to the crime scene. They're going to, this is going to be used on 57 sites. And it's hoped this will act as a deterrent for potential underwater thieves. This is part of the Heritage Watch scheme, which aims to help stop crime at heritage sites at sea and encourage the public to help too. Uh, it said the marking of artefacts is a great leap forward in helping to protect them. These 57 sites will have the highest level of protection under the Protection of Rex Acts 1973, meaning only licensed divers can dive them and their contents are protected by law. One of the protected sites being marked is the Klein Hollandia a mysterious warship whose identity was only discovered earlier this year. Its condition, we are told, is remarkable, and it could offer lots of information about how 17th century Dutch ships were built. Mark B.T. Edwards, who is a licensee of the site, said they are very happy it's been chosen for protection. Quote, being so far offshore, it's vulnerable to illegal visits and recoveries. This new technology will give us peace of mind. Now, did I laugh at the name of this county? Yes, I did. Am I an adult? Occasionally. New Brighton in Beaver County. This is one of those ones that are pronounced Beauvoir. Beaver County, founded in 1838, we are told has countless history markers recalling the town's past. It's clearly a haven for history buffs. But a recent discovery underneath the borough's Merrick Art Gallery still gives the director goosebumps. They believe they have found an underground passageway that may be linked to the Underground Railroad. This is a secret tunnel they found from the 1800s after maintenance workers handled a plumbing issue. The Underground Railroad journey that took enslaved people from southern states up to Ohio, uh, up to the Ohio River to the Beaver River, they followed the North Star. Where Beaver and Ohio River meet directly is, a, is above the North Star. 
history books detail how many Quakers living in New Brighton helped enslaved people find houses. The James Edgar House sits across the street from the Merrick, this museum, and legend has it that a tunnel ran underground from this gallery, which was a train station, to the house which was used to rescue enslaved people. It's hard to say how many runaway enslaved people came through New Brighton, but this tunnel may offer another glimpse into this secret network. This tunnel dig also turned up old glass and relics from an adjacent demolished church. The plan is to get digging on the other side of the tunnel, which is 62 feet. Gallery officials want to secure it and hopefully offer a tour someday. How fascinating. Incredible. Another secret room that's been found. In a 16th century Italian chapel where Michael Colangelo hid and drew for months is now open to the public. This is the in the Basilica of San Lorenzo. There is a secret room believed to have been decorated by Michelangelo. Now the chamber, which is part of the Museum of the Medici Chapels, is going to open to the public for the first time. Do check out this article because the pictures that you can't see quite so well in this small format are fabulous. These works are brilliant. There's a corridor measuring about 32 feet long, 10 feet wide and 8 feet tall. It had been used to store, store coal and it had been sealed shut some 20 year, years prior, accessible only by a narrow stairway beneath a trap door. It had con been concealed beneath a wardrobe amid a pile of unused furniture and decor. There was once a plan to create a new tourist entry and exit point from the museum. The moment you enter the room, we're told you are simply speechless. Why, though, would Michelangelo have been sequestered in this subterranean space? At the time, the artist's main patrons, the Medici family, had just returned from exile, having been overthrown by a popular revolt in 1527. Michelangelo had worked on behalf of the Republican government, supervising the city's fortification. Pope Clement VII, a member of the family, had sentenced him to death because of this. But hiding with the Basilica was a way for Michelangelo to lay low until he could get back into the Pope's good graces. Fortunately, the Medicis did forgive Michelangelo about two months later. And it's thought these sketches appear to be the work of Michelangelo. So even in that moment of terror, he couldn't stop himself from drawing. There is limited access to this secret room. The museum is making just 100 tickets priced at 32 euros or 34 dollars, including access to the Medici Chapel. Only 100 tickets are going to be available each week with 15 minute slots for groups of four. There is a 45 minute gap between each visit to limit the work's exposure to light. So if you are going to be in Florence, um, I think that that although there's a limited number of tickets, personally, I think if you can be in Florence, 32 euros, $34 is not cheap, but this is a once in a lifetime, a once in a lifetime thing to see, I think. Swiss Museum has reached a last minute a restitution, restitution agreement over a Cezanne painting that was headed to Christie's. Museum Langmat announced last month that it would be selling up to three Paul Cezanne masterworks in its collection at Christie's upcoming 20th century sale in New York in November. But on Monday, the museum said that the pre sale provenance research found evidence that the sales star, uh, Fruit et Paul, de Georges Bois may have been sold to the institution under duress. They have since reached out to the heirs of Jacob Goldsmith, a Jewish art dealer who had jointly acquired the painting in 1929, and they have reached a restitution agreement with the assistance of Christie's. The terms were not announced, but we do know that the painting carries an estimate of between 35 to 55 million dollars. So this was paint, was purchased in 1933 from the then owners, Goldschmidt's Gallery, uh, M. Goldschmidt & Co. in Frankfurt. However, according to the museum, Goldschmidt's life and li livelihood were under constant threat after the Nazi party took power in 1933. 
So until recently, there, we're told there was no suspicion that this painting was purchased under duress, uh, and there was no mention of the probability of restitution claim when the sale was announced. It wasn't until very lo late in the process, as it often is, that a piece of evidence came up that made us think that the best course of action was to approach the heirs. And while the historical documents are unclear, the context was obvious. Goldschmidt wasn't able to operate as he normally would have in the years prior. Uh, while there may not be a certain case for restitution, the Foundation Langmat and the museum thought the most respectful way to move forward with the sale was to loco locate the heirs and with Christie's reach an amicable solution. A settlement, we're told, was reached in the last few days and the muse and the sale is going to move ahead. Christie said they were, quote, committed to the vital research which informs our cataloguing process with the goal of ensuring the fullest possible access to provenance information for the property in our auctions. Uh, this will be selling at Christie's. Um, so I did a little jump there. It's selling at Christie's, uh, so the foundation can raise $45 million to bolster its endowment fund. The works will be sold in order. So we've got this one, and then we've got Quatre Pomme en un Couteau and La Mer et le Stack until the total bid reaches or surpasses $45 million, at which any of the works that remain will be returned, removed and returned to the museum. I don't know how I feel about that, about, about a museum being so desperate for funds that they are selling three of their works, potentially to private owners. But if they are, if you're desperate, I suppose you're desperate, right? A new memorial is open to honour the victims of the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire. Until recently, a blue plaque was the only marker indicating the builder at the corner of Green Street and Washington Place was the site of New York's deadliest workplace disaster. On March 25th, 1911, 146 workers, mostly young women, many of whom were immigrants, died when a fire broke out at the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory. Stymied by a broken elevator, a collapsed fire escape and a locked exit, many jumped and fell to their deaths on the sidewalk almost 10 storeys below. This did help to spur safety reforms such as sprinklers in high-rise buildings and it galvanised the movement for workers' rights. Um, now, now over a century later, the Remember the Triangle Fire Coalition, an organisation of victims' relatives and labour organisations, has unveiled a memorial honouring the victims of the fire and the tragedy's role in the labour rights movement. I absolutely agree, because all too often, like, for example, we there's obviously in both the UK and the US in different forms, there have been some trade union activity and I do see people sort of there have been cases of people who complain about the power of the trade unions etc and this tells me that people haven't looked into the history because the reason that your boss can't just casually poison you because it makes life cheaper for them is because of striking the the fact that you get weekends off and holidays and that you can go off sick without losing your job, all of that, the, the fact that there is basic safety is all because of the tireless efforts that are put forward by trade unions. And the, the, frankly, the stronger a trade union is, I believe, the, the better the country you live in, personally. So, yes, I'm very pleased about this. Um, and... So the people who were involved in putting this together, quote, we want people to go there and be inspired. We want to say workers shouldn't have to die for other working people to be safe. And we should all hold the government's feet to the fire. We should unite with other workers. I agree.
We've got an auction coming up. A 1,000-year-old bronze astrolabe is expected to fetch millions when it's auctioned at Sotheby's. This dates um, originates from 9th and 10th century back Baghdad. Sotheby's is doing an Arts of the Islamic World and India sale in London, which does give me pause. They claim that they're looking into provenance is like their big, big bad job. I hope it is. This is a bronze astrolabe that's expected to sell for £2.5 million. That is $2.9 million. It's uh, a 1,000-year-old astronomical instrument, which is etched with an intricate Kufic script and is designed to track celestial move movements. Crafted in the scientific crucible of 9th and 10th century Baghdad, the heart of the world's scientific knowledge during the era, this early feat of engineering has endured the ages and remained a closely guarded treasure within a private collection. I mean, what a phenomenal piece. And such a, such a level of complexity in creating it and, and also being able to use it. It was acquired by the current owner, we're told, in 1982, also going on sale is a, a bronze measuring cup adorned with inscriptions of prayers and praise to the divine that dates back to 1184 AD and might be worth around a quarter of a million euros. There's also a 12th century incense burner, which we can see pictured here, fashioned into the image of a bird that holds an estimate of 180,000 euros to 230,000 euros. There's also a collection of plates from Turkey that are in, adorned with intricate floral patterns reminiscent of ancient Islamic arts. Sotheby's have orchestrated this Arts of the Islamic World and India auction on the 25th of October. This happened on the 25th of October. I will go back and see what happened with these pieces. Our last piece of new news. Pirate treasure are i'm kidding i'm very much kidding i don't know why i did that uh, a nautical chart that sold at auction for two hundred thirty-nine thousand dollars is revealed to be the fourth oldest of its kind and it's now tagged at 7.5 chameleon dollars oh boy um as the state girl stales of the uber wealthy go, the Anne and Gordon Getty collection sell off at Christie's last year was a major success. I don't know why I got piratey. Um, however, one lot was a major blunder from the perspective, at least, of Christie's. This is a vellum nautical map known as a portland chart that depicts the waterways of the Mediterranean and beyond. It's red rum lines reaching into the North Atlantic and stretching stretches of the Eurasian steppe. Christie's labelled the idiosyncratic and unusual map as early 16th century and gave it a $100,000 to $150,000 estimate. But then a San Diego map dealer sent something older rarer he sniffed out the treasure in the treasure map if you will uh, and maybe that's it the real treasure is actually the map Ooh, heart of the ocean some words um a crescent flag hovers over southeastern spain signifying the presence of a moorish kingdom that wouldn't be defeated until 1492 the borders of mainland europe are convoluting suggested su convoluted suggested in time before the conclusion of the hunt Hundred Years War. Curious too are the lingering Crusader strongholds yet to be ejected from the Levant. I have literally no shame, Shane. I, I'm going to lean into it. I, I'm, I'm proud of it because you know what? Sometimes when you've been mum all day, <laughs> you need to be dad at night. What am I? I maybe I'm not. Well, maybe I've not got better and I'm just, this is a fever dream and I'm Delulu. <laughs> um, so Chris's suggestion of 1500 to 1525 seemed off, but not by decades, but by centuries. The Clawson suspected this chart had in fact been drawn in the early 1400s and then with 
when he spoke to scholars and um, c catalogers, that date got then pushed even further back to the mid 1350s. Chrissy suggested that the Portland chart was, quote, undoubtedly produced for display for a wealthy Genoese client. In fact, all evidence pointed to Genoa's, Genoa's great maritime rival, Venice. Christie's, babe, what are you doing? Oh, you've, um, that's a bobo. Uh, it came up for auction in October 2022, and Clausen, together with his team, the map dealers, Barry Lawrence and Rudderman, brought it for $239,000. A big auction house. Is this? Oh, um, this is the fourth oldest surviving portal and chart of Europe. The oldest being the Carta Paisana from the late 13th century, which is held by the National Library of France. The asking price is now $7.5 million. Another category of collecting altogether and one that will likely remain framed on Clausen's office wall until a university or museum decides to take ownership of it. In the meantime, scholars are lining up to write the definitive essay on the Portland for the International Journal for the History of Cartography. Quote, we have talked to many niche subject matter experts about how this chart impacts their work. I'm particularly interested in hearing from people outside of the map world on their insights. I, pff, Christie's, it's a, bad, it's, a bad, it's a bad day for Christie's, is what I'm going to say. Come on. Oh. Oh, it's having a my, my little my little iPad's having a mare. Oh dear. Oh, there we go. Um, we are now moving on to my solo solitary ding dong. There's a bell. There it is. There he is. My little peeing boy. Ding a ling a ling. Time for a ding dong. Anyone for a ding dong. Four people have accused been accused of stealing one million dollars of dinosaur bones and exporting them to China. Two Utahns, is that what you call me from Utah? Utahns. Two Utahns, an Oregon man and a California man, have been accused of stealing more than $1 million worth of paleontological resources and selling some illegally to buyers in China. A federal ground jury in Salt Lake City indicted Vint Wade, 65, and Donna Wade, 67, of Moab, Stephen Willing, 67, of Los Angeles, California, and Jordan Willing, 40, of Ashland, Oregon, on charges of causing $3 million of damages and stealing more than $1 million in paleontological resources, which included dinosaur bones from federal land. This is a, they are at their big age. At their big age. What, like, Utahns, Utahns. Yeah, that's what I thought, but it's, they've, in this one, they've spelled, maybe it's a spelling error. They've definitely spelled it Utahns, which doesn't, doesn't make sense. Yeah, I mean, China is not, like, at a loss for dinosaur bits. They're good. They've got, they've got, they grow their own over there. Yeah. Um, so, according to court documents, two unindicted co conspirators who are collected the dinosaur bones excavated, removed, transported, and sold these items to the Wades. The Wades are dinosaur bone collectors and own Wade's Rocks in Moab. Apparently they sold approximately $1.4 million worth of resources to the Willings, equating to about 280, sorry, 28,000 pounds of dinosaur bones, including cabs, jewellery, knives, beads, carvings. What? So they made dinosaur bones into these things? They exported them to China. Oh, no, they mislabeled them. They exported them to China, mislabeling the dinosaur bones and deflating their values so that government agents would not su suspect the shipments. Um, on at least four occasions, they shipped containers of dinosaur bones to China to make commercial products, including dinosaur dig kits and carved figurines. Are 
you telling me that when you buy one of those like little plaster of Paris rocks that you let your kid chisel away at, that it might have a stolen dinosaur bone in it. Well, that's just something else to freak out about, isn't it? Fabulous. Fabulous. So the US District Attorney, Trina Higgins, said during a press conference on Thursday that because these bones were removed from their original locations and then further processed, it destroyed their scientific value. Quote, whatever we could gain by knowing the location they're at, what other bones were near, were near, the type of soil they were found in, all of that scientific value was lost when they were removed. So although dinosaur bones and all of the paleontological resources have a value on some markets, the true loss of removing these items from public lands cannot be monetarily measured. It is invaluable. That's the thing as well. It's when, when I'm all for amateur archaeologists. I think we celebrate them quite a lot when they're out with their little beep beeps and they find really cool stuff. But it's super, super important to like do a little bit of educating of yourself if you're going to go out with a metal detector. Because if you find something that could potentially be the tip of a very, very large, very interesting archaeological iceberg, you need to know how to mark it and how not to disturb the ground too much. Because the layers, the striation of the earth are vitally important for dating stuff. Um, the Wades face charges of conspiracy against the US, violating the Paleontological Resources Preservation Act, theft of US property, attempted smuggling, providing false export information and money laundering. Donna Wade is also accused of false labelling of paleontological resources and false declaration to federal agents. The Willings face alleged charges of conspiracy against the US, violating the Paleontological Resources Preservation Act and theft of US property. Jordan Willing is also accused of false labelling of paleontological resources, attempted smuggling and providing false export information. So if and when we know what their ultimate charges are going to be, or their, sorry, their ultimate sentences are going to be, I will, of course, let you know. Those are our ding-dongs. I'm going to move on to events and exhibitions. As usual, there is uh, a list to the access information, both in the description box and also on the Opera Pinboard. So if you do have access needs, I have, as well as linking ticket things, museum links. I've also linked the access separately, so you can just go straight to that uh, if that's useful to you. So first things first, we've talked about this brooch, it being discovered. I got very excited because of how pretty it is. It's a very shiny, I want a reproduction, I want one. This is going on display in Somerset in the UK at the Museum of Somerset. It's went on display from Friday the 20th of October. So it's still on display now. I think it's going potentially on, it seems to be on permanent display from now on. And this museum is free entry with donations welcome. So when you go into free museums, do make sure that you put a little donation in and also spend liberally in the gift shop. <laughs> Look after your local museums. Over in Denmark, we have this exhibition, Ancient Egypt Obsessed with Life. This is a special exhibition that opened on the 13th of October 2023 and is running until the 18th of October 2024. And if you can see that little kind of camo coloured box, greeny camo coloured box, what I think is particularly interesting is the smell is this bit smell the fragrance of eternity, which to some people might sound like a threat, but to me sounds like a good time. This is in the exhibition, visitors can smell a 3,500 year old embalming oil. The fragrance originates from the mummification of the high ranking Egyptian wet nurse of Pharaoh Amen Amenhotep II. I am I've talked about it before. I am so fascinated by the way in which all of the senses are being used or being appealed to in museum exhibitions as it goes on. I, I think that the work that's being done in kind of excavating and reconstructing smells is really useful because one th 
another thing that I'm really passionate about, but sadly don't know much about and would like to look into more, is making heritage sites as accessible as per as possible. So making sure that there are uh, lifts to all floors, but also making sure that if somebody is visually impaired, that, that they are tactile spaces, they are sensory spaces, that also there are spaces where if people are neurodivergent, that there can be quiet hours or quiet mornings or quiet days um, where lights are dimmed and, and those kinds of, and, and talking to the local community to make sure that heritage space and sites are for everybody and that everybody can get something out of them. Um, and so I think that the use of smell is really useful, yeah, really good and really useful and, and will help a lot of people to engage with the past and not just people who have difficulties with, with sight or with hearing or whatever else, but I think everybody can benefit from smelling the past. It's just another way in. Um, so yeah, this is really cool. Um, the National Museum of Scotland. A rare silver 16th century basin and ewer is going to go on display at the National Museum. These were acquired for the nation under the acceptance in lieu scheme. So things like this would be the sort of thing, I think this may just be a ceremonial version, but if if it was in use, when, you know, somebody like a monarch or a very, very high-ranking noble person is about to sit down at the table and have their food and they want to wash their hands, they'll be sat at the table with a diaper cloth over their shoulder there the person attending them who may be a servant it may be a courtier will come up with this basin and ewer in the ewer will be some kind of warm scented water maybe it'll be scented with rose or perfume or whatever and then this person will place their hands under and um it will they will the person serving them will pour this warmed water onto their hands so they can wash their hands before they eat or before they do something anything else when they if they want their hands washed maybe they'll do it in the morning and then they will dry their hands in their diaper cloth and get to work and they on eating or whatever else and then they will probably come back and wash their hands before they get up from the table so this is uh this is um a really interesting thing and last but by no means least, if you are in Michigan and you have access to the Henry Ford Museum, they have got an, uh, a new exhibition on Nelson Mandela. This is called the official exhibition. It opened October 21st and it will be running until January the 15th, 2024. It is not free. You have to buy tickets. The gallery is open from 9.30 to 5 p.m. Um, and if you remember, though, apparently it is free to enter. So those are the news stories that I have for you for today. As I said, I have seen the news items that have been coming in since Monday. I was supposed to give this one out on Monday. I will be compiling all of that. Do keep your eyes peeled. So after the next video goes live on Friday, premieres on Friday, there will be a link to the next History News Live that will be taking place next Sunday. So not in two days' time, in a week and two days' time. So that will be the next History News Live. That will be our second and last one for November. And then we are going into December. And I'm going to have to look at when Christmas things are, because I think Christmas might be on a Monday or there or thereabouts. So uh, I will see what happens, and I will make sure to let you know plenty of time uh, ahead of time if we are moving from a Monday when we are going and uh, yes I hope you've enjoyed this one if you have watched along live thank you so much if you are watching the playback thank you for your time I hope that you are going to have a wonderful weekend I can say that this time and for those of you who've also who also joined me for the the video today that premiered thank you for your kind comments on that um, it seemed like lots of you really enjoyed that I really enjoyed making it and I'm very pleased that it went down so well. And maybe some of you will be seeing me when the talk is released tomorrow. And maybe others of you will be also seeing me on Sunday for a QA. and a You are going to be sick of the sight of me by the end of this weekend. But I will never be sick of the sight of you. Thank you all so very, very much. And uh, please do 
hit all the buttons, subscribe, hit the bell, hit the like, put emojis, social glyphs in the comments, boost the engagement, share it, share my channel, all that good stuff. And uh, but that's all for me for now. And so until next time, I do hope you're going to have a wonderful day, wherever you are in your day. As I said, a wonderful weekend. But do take care of yourselves. Bye-bye for now.